for commercial galleries and glass shops, uh, an apprentice would be uh, probably five to ten years. The relationships between uh, the master and the apprentice is um, quite dynamic and the demands on, on both uh, sides of the fence. And there's a lot of coordination between two different people uh, with two different skill sets uh, working at the same time. And there is an etiquette with uh, glass blowing shops where there is no fault uh, with the helper if something goes wrong, because that means the, uh, the master wasn't clear enough in the instructions uh, to make it happen. So uh, they, the thing about those masters is that make it look so easy, um, but it is not. To become a master, uh, at least uh, 10 years. Uh, and I don't really consider myself a master at all, uh, but I've been blowing glass for 25 years and it's uh, it's always a challenge it's uh, every time you work on something it's uh, brand new the relationship that Jesus invites us into invites you and me the master of life and love inviting us his disciples his learners his students his pupils his apprentices into this relationship, a direct and dynamic relationship so that we can learn to live and love like he does. He makes it look so easy. And in this apprenticeship series, we've learned that we believe in him and we seek to be with him. And today we're going to talk about being a learner of Jesus so that we can become like Jesus, so that we can behave like Jesus. And today, as we talk about learning uh, of Jesus, I want to make sure you understand it's not learning about Jesus. It's not just trivia and facts. It's not like we're going to be on the Jeopardy game show of life or something like that and get stumped by some difficult answer we don't know the question to. And so, um, you know, this happened this week in Final Jeopardy. This answer showed up on the screen in Final Jeopardy. It's a Bible question, or it's a Bible answer. He tells his son not to worry about the lamb for the burnt offering. God will provide it. And every contestant got it wrong. Even the returning champion missed it. And I, I happen to know it. The, the right question is, it's not who is Jesus. I know that's the obvious one everybody would pick, right? But it, it's who is Abraham, okay? And, uh, but it, this reminds me of a recurring dream I've had as an adult for years. And I haven't had it in a while, but I'll probably have it tonight because I talked about it. But that recurring dream is I, as your pastor, am introduced as your pastor on Jeopardy, and I'm, I'm way ahead because, you know, I'm smart like that, okay? It's a dream, okay? It's a dream. But I'm way ahead until we get to Final Jeopardy, and the topic for Final Jeopardy is... The Bible. So being a pastor with two seminary degrees, I wager everything I've got. And when the answer shows up, I don't know the right question. I have who or what is blank. I mean, I'm just drawing a blank and everybody else knows it. And of course, I wake up before I ever finish that dream every time. So again, that when this Bible question came up on Wednesday of this week in Final Jeopardy, I thought about that recurring dream that I have. What I want you to know is that when we talk about learning of Jesus, we're not talking about that kind of stuff. It's not about him. It's not facts and trivia. Nor do we have to speculate about what would Jesus do in a given situation. What we're talking about today is learning of Jesus, learning from Jesus, learning with Jesus. And that's what he invites us into. So that when we're just going down the road of life, we run into situations and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what? That's that thing Jesus was talking about. Or that's that thing Jesus was really trying to get me to understand the other day when I was reading the scriptures. And the light comes on and we go, oh, okay, so I know what to do now. We don't have to speculate, let's see, and contemplate. What would Jesus do? We can actually learn from him those things we need to do. From what he said, what he did. You may be thinking, now, how does that work? How do we learn from Jesus? Well, I want you to look with me in a copy of God's Word or open the church app to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. 
John chapter 14, this is the text we've been using for this entire series. It's where we're going to stay all through the rest of October as we look at John 14 and this apprenticeship series. You know if you've been here the last week or have seen a sermon out of this series before that we've been talking about John 14 in this way. This is where Jesus is sitting at the table the last night where he's sharing the last supper with his disciples. They're down to 11. Judas, the betrayer, has bailed, and there's only 11 left. Jesus is headed to the cross the next day. He knows that. The disciples can't really figure that out. We've got hindsight, so we know what they should expect, but they don't figure it out, really, until they see it themselves. Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom he's going to start and establish But he's beginning to talk about dying and leaving them, and it's really throwing them off. In the very first sermon of the series, in the first verse of this chapter 14 of John, we hear Jesus saying, hey, guys, don't let this throw you. Just keep trusting me. Keep Have confidence in me. Keep believing. Keep on believing. Keep at believing. Don't quit. And then he begins to talk with them about how it is that he is going to make sure they are able to learn from him, even though he is going to be absent from them. He begins to talk about the spirit he's going to ask the Father to send. We know it as the Holy Spirit. The scriptures call the Holy Spirit uh, the spirit of truth, the helper, uh, the spirit of Christ. And here's what Jesus is talking about. Pick up with me, if you would, in verse 16 of John 14. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. Jesus is talking about his own spirit. Whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, the next day Jesus was crucified. Three days later he was raised from the grave. And then he was seen by about 500 different followers of his Over the next 40 days, he went to be at the right hand of the Father, and then the Holy Spirit, in his absence, came to be present, not just with the disciples, but began to be in the disciples. And that's one of the things that you and I, as followers of Christ, learn from the Scriptures, is that as followers of Christ, we have his Spirit, this helper, this Spirit of truth, living in us, dwelling within us. And so we are going to be learning from Jesus by the presence of his spirit. Let's keep going. Look over in verses 25 and 26 of John 14. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So this is how we learn from Jesus. We learn as his spirit teaches us. Let's keep going over in chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. Jesus is still talking, and then he says this, really interesting stuff. I have many more things to say to you, but you can't handle them right now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit living inside of us as believers, those of us who follow Christ, who are his apprentices, is the one who teaches us how to live the master's life. He uses really two resources. He uses the words of Christ and he uses the actions of Christ. Go back in chapter 14, look in verse 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. His material, his source, what he's going to do to teach us is teach us Help us understand as he explains and reminds us all that Jesus said and did. And here's what I want you to hear today. We have all the words recorded that Jesus spoke on this earth in the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then we have the acts of Christ through his spirit working in the disciples in the book of Acts. So those four Gospels plus the book of Acts is our curriculum. 
It helps us see, watch, observe, listen, and hear what the master does. And Jesus makes this life and loving so easy. He makes it look so easy. It's, it's amazing how he does that. And we can study that and watch him and observe. But can I share something with you? It is not enough for us as apprentices to just watch and observe what the master does. It would be like the glass blowing apprentice going watching a master get glass blower uh, and just watching and taking notes and going, wow, pretty sweet. Oh, wow. He, wow, that was pretty cool right there. What, and that's all they do. They would never learn the trade, the art, the craft of glass blowing. You and I as apprentices must do more than just observe and watch and study and learn and see and listen what the master said and master did. We must take it a step further. What's that step? Here's the key to learning from Jesus. We must learn to begin to practice those things he said and did for ourselves. Now, the big nasty word for that is obedience. And I realize we don't really like that word. The word obedience, we just don't like because it is a flashback to our childhood when our parents told us to do this or to do that. And we would say, why? And they would say, because I told you so, right? I mean, that's the answer they would give us, right? So it just doesn't feel good when someone says, you need to learn to obey Jesus. What well, can I get you to think about obedience in just a little different light? What if you begin to look at obedience as just doing what the master said to do so that you could do what the master did? In other words, the master go to the apprentice and say, hey, okay, you see, that didn't work very well, right? Okay, so let's try it my way. Let's see if we can do it this. And you begin to practice for yourself the things that he's showing you to do. So it's just practice. And get this, there, there, there's no risk of failure, really, because we're going to mess it up. Jesus knows we're going to mess it up. I, I love what the professor said in the video when he said, if there's a mistake that is made, there is no fault placed on the helper, on the apprentice. All the responsibility of that goes to the master. And you and I need to be reminded that as followers of Christ, what we believe is this, is that our sins, our mistakes, our failures are already covered by Christ for us because he died for them on the cross. So he's already paid the penalty. So there's no fault when we mess up. So there's no risk in trying. So many times people just fail to follow what God wants them to do because they're afraid they're going to mess it up. You can't mess it up. You're just practicing you're just trying to do what Jesus said, and he knows that you're going to need help. And, and I want you to hear this. It's not about trying harder. There's no expectation of perfection, and it's not about trying harder. It's really actually just trying again and again and again. Now, one of my favorite authors in this topic, in, in Evans too, we both quoted him a lot, is a man named Dallas Willard. He went home to be with Jesus about seven years ago after battling with pancreatic cancer. And um, in his book, Divine Conspiracy, here's what he's talking about. This is what he shares with us about this idea of obedience and trying again and again and again. He calls it the abundance obedience flywheel. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more. But first, I want to make sure you understand what is meant by a flywheel. So I brought a little video for you. And by the way, there's no audio. You'll have to read the narration as it's on the screen, okay? So watch this short video about a flywheel. Okay, so maybe you have seen a flywheel in action up close and personal. Maybe you've used a flywheel as a tool or uh, instrument or some kind. I've been the victim of a flywheel. Uh, 
So several years ago, Valerie and I were living in Dallas, and one of the things we like to do is ride our bikes. They had trails everywhere. And one of the favorite trails that we like to do is um, leave our downtown condo and ride our bikes out to White Rock Lake. And it was about a seven-mile trip out to the lake, then 10 miles around the lake, and then seven miles back. So one morning, I was out on that 24-mile trek and doing pretty well, and then all of a sudden, I hadn't paid attention to the weather. The weather changed, and the north wind began to blow, and I was about halfway around that lake when I hit this wall of the north wind, and I was leaning in and trying to make it, and I was a little bit uphill, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a grandpa came flying by me on his bike. I'm talking Paul on his bike. He just was flying and hardly even pedaling much. And I'm like, what the, man, I, I was digging in and I was trying to lean in and trying to get there. And man, it was just exhausted me. And finally I caught up to him because he was, had stopped and was getting his bike back in his car. And um, I just stopped and I said, sir, that was impressive. How long have you been riding a bike? He said, oh, I've been riding for a while, but this is a brand new bike, and it's cool because it has a flywheel on it. I went, oh, well, no wonder, and I couldn't believe it. So this flywheel just blew by me. That's how he was able to do that because as he pushed and pushed, every time he pushed, it gained more momentum. What Dallas Willard is saying to us is there's this abundance and obedience flywheel effect, and it goes like this. The more we study the scriptures, the more we look into the gospels and study and learn from the master about what he said and what he did, we realize how much God loves us, and there's just this incredible abundance there, and we become these people that want to obey what Jesus said do, and live and love like Jesus did. And so we begin to obey, and when we begin to obey, we realize this incredible spiritual endorphin kind of thing where we experience it, and we realize God's way really is better than our own, and we receive even more abundance by doing that, and then we obey some more, and then abundance comes more to us because we realize it, and it goes into full effect, and then we want to obey more, so we obey more, and abundance and obedience and abundance and obedience, and it becomes this flywheel thing that happens in our life, and eventually... We gain the capacity to be able to do what Jesus told us to do. In fact, we see that's exactly what Jesus did and modeled for us. If you look just a few chapters over in the Gospel of John, in chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus describes how he himself has become a master of doing the things that Jesus did. He says this, John chapter 5, verse 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son, speaking of himself, can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these same things the Son also does in like manner. Jesus, the Son, was able to live and love like he did because he just watched and learned from the Father and did what the Father did. You and I can have the same experience in our lives. If you go back to John 14, he says it this way. John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey me. You will practice the things I say do. Verse 23, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. This idea of the more we obey, the more we receive the abundant presence. The more we receive the abundance of presence of God and the blessings of God, the more we will want to obey and back and forth and back and forth. It's that flywheel effect. So I want you to take some action this week. I want to encourage you with some steps to take. And at first, it may sound a little bit like, well, I want you to read your Bible more and pray more, but I want you to hang with me because I don't think it's really like that. The first thing I want you to do as an apprentice in thinking about this and learning from Jesus is, is to establish a reading plan. If you really want to spend time understanding and learning from Jesus, seeing how he did what he did, then studying the four Gospels and the book of Acts is very important. In those five books, there were 117 chapters. You have 365 days in a year, right? So if you took one chapter per day and read them, you could read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts over three times in a year span. But what if you actually put it to a different calendar or your own calendar, however much you want to do? What if just the rest of the calendar year you spent in the Gospel of John? 
And then in the first quarter of 2021, picked up Matthew, second quarter, Mark, third quarter, Luke, fourth quarter of 2021, the book of Acts, and just spent time really unpacking and reading over and over and over again what Jesus said, what Jesus did. Learn from that, watching, observing, seeing what he did. While you're at it, then make an observation plan. List out the things you see Jesus doing. Mark out patterns that you see Jesus doing over and over. Even put them in categories of the kinds of things Jesus did or the kinds of ways that Jesus responded to things. Because what will happen when you do that is that you and I will go through life and we'll recognize scenes that we know what to do because we saw what Jesus did in those situations. But then I want you to understand that it's not enough to just read and study or even observe what the master does. It's time to actually implement that flywheel plan. And take some steps of practice. I know it's the word obedience, but take some steps practicing what Jesus said to do. And I want to encourage you. Start with the easiest thing. Start with what Jesus said has said to you that you might actually do fairly easily. In fact, if you're like me, when you go to make a to-do list, what do you include on there? You include the stuff you've already done, right, so you can mark it off, right, okay? So, so maybe you would start with that on your list, you know, and already realize that you've been practicing some of those things, but start with the easy stuff. And, and, and find something that you, you find fairly easy and begin to do it and see if you can master it like Jesus mastered it. And then add more and add more and add more and add more. And eventually, over time, learning with that flywheel effect, you'll find yourself, I'll find myself becoming greater and greater at doing what Jesus said. And it'll become greater in our capacity to do those things. Build up to the really tough stuff. Now, Jesse's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. And uh, lead us in another song uh, before we go. So, Jesse, thanks. Appreciate it.